Uh, hello, um, we're very pleased to present the um, Hamid Weith Memorial Lecture, um, Where Do We Go From Here, Fighting's Best Wear and Stalker Wear. Um, for those of you who didn't know him, uh, Helmut Weith was a, he was a talented computer scientist, but he cared about a lot more than computer science. He started the first Logic Lounge in um, 2014 at Flock um, because he wanted to share the idea that we should be doing more than just writing papers. The purpose of computer science is to make the world a better place and to solve the problems of the world. And we do that by both bringing people in so that we see about the problems of the world. We do that by increasing diversity throughout the computer science community. And we do that by focusing on the problems that are really affecting people in their day-to-day -day lives. Which is why I'm very excited to have um, Eva Galperin, the Director of Cybersecurity for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, who's out there every day fighting for people's civil liberties and fighting to make the internet a better and a safer place. Thank you so much for coming. I'm so glad to see so many of you out here. Uh, how many of you here are already familiar with the Electronic Frontier Foundation? Yes. Oh, I love it when I don't have to do any work. Um, so the very short version, the TLDR of EFF is uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is a digital civil liberties organization. We uh, work hard to make sure that when you go online, your rights come with you. Uh, and for, in order to accomplish this goal, we have sort of an interesting toolkit of, uh, of employees. So uh, the internet is vast, its problems are uh, also vast, and uh, you don't always use the same tools in order to solve those problems. So sometimes those problems can be solved uh, with activists, by getting people out in the street, uh, by protesting, by uh, launching petitions, by meeting with politicians, and for that purpose, we have an activism team. Sometimes uh, problems can be solved through uh, impact litigation. So we file lawsuits uh, that, whose goal is not just to help the people who are directly involved in the suit, the plaintiffs or the defendants, but to create law that will advance uh, digital civil liberties, whether that's privacy or security or your right to free speech or uh, your right to the fair use of intellectual property. We have you know, all kinds of, of different concerns. Uh, and finally, sometimes the thing you have to do is uh, you need a pack of computer scientists. Sometimes you need engineers. Uh, sometimes those engineers build tools that we think will be useful uh, for the internet that no one else is building. So uh, among other things, EFF is responsible for CertBot. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with CertBot, but uh, it is the service that allows you to very easily uh, deploy SSL on your uh, website for free. Uh, we also make a web extension called HTTPS Everywhere, which makes sure that if you are going to a website, and it supports uh, HTTPS that you are using it by default. And uh, through these two tools, we've done a lot to encrypt the web. Um, in addition to this, uh, this is not the only thing that our engineers do. Um, I have a, a, my own little team of engineers, and uh, we are called EFF Threat Lab. And what we do is we focus on uh, the needs of vulnerable populations all over the world. So that would be journalists, activists, lawyers, scientists, people who are being targeted by, uh, by governments. Um, when governments spy on each other, that's certainly a problem and it makes the news. But when governments spy on each other, it is business as usual. Governments have you know, a surveillance apparatus, there is an expectation that spies spy on other spies and this is how it goes. When 
Governments spy on individuals when they spy on people trying to hold the powerful accountable, when they intimidate them in this way. These are often people who don't have their own security teams. They don't have a surveillance apparatus and they don't have anybody backing them up. This is a, a tremendous sort of uh, inequality of power. And one of the things that Threat Lab uh, tries to do is we try to address that inequality uh, because asymmetries of power bug me. So, uh, to that end, uh, I spent several years uh, before starting EFF's Threat Lab uh, working on APTs. How many of you are familiar with, uh, with the term APT? Okay, about half of you. So, uh, APT stands for Advanced Persistent Threat, and it is generally the way that InfoSec people talk about uh, government and state actors, um, especially the kind that go after, after individuals. Uh, so famous APTs include China, uh, all the Five Eyes countries, the US, Canada, England, or Great Britain, uh, I, are they Brexiting? Are they falling apart? I don't know. Um, I'll check the paper. Uh, New Zealand and Australia. Uh, Russia is a very famous APT. It has uh, two APTs that are frequently in the news, usually uh, called uh, Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear. Uh, one of the funny things about APTs is we get all kinds of fanciful names. This is one of the reasons I love APT research. I get to name them sometimes. I name all of mine after cats. Um, so there I was. I spent several years uh, researching APTs. Uh, do we have slides? Are slides happening? Nothing? Nothing? Is a universe of APTs? Yeah? Okay, cool. So uh, there I was. Researching APTs. I uh, spent several years researching um, state sympathetic actors that were targeting uh, dissidents opposed to the Assad government uh, in 2011, 2012, and 2013. So sort of the very beginnings of the Syrian civil war. And this was a really touchy time because uh, Assad at the time controlled uh, pretty much all of the infrastructure uh, so it was very easy to spy on people inside of the areas where he controlled the infrastructure, where he controlled the ISPs. Uh, most internet traffic was, at the time, uh, still unencrypted. And so if you control the ISP, you can see what everybody is doing pretty much all the time. Um, but uh, there were dissidents that existed outside of his uh, ability to spy. And so there were people going around um, tricking uh, dissidents into installing malware on their computers that would allow uh, these pro-Assad actors to spy on, uh, on people opposed to the Assad regime. Uh, they would then later get visits uh, from the uh, uh, security forces and they would be sent to detention centers where they were frequently killed and tortured. Uh, according to Amnesty International reports. So this was definitely one of those cases where, uh, where rats, remote access tools, were leading directly to physical harm. Uh, and so this is a, a case that I cared about very much. Um, I spent several years doing this work uh, with a number of other security researchers in the before time. Uh, and I did it all the way up until about 2015, 2016. I did it through 2017. And at the end of 2017, I discovered that one of my fellow researchers was a serial rapist, because of course. And I was mad, really, really mad. And I did what angry people throughout the history of time have always done. I took to the internet and I tweeted. And the thing that I tweeted was, uh, if, if you're a woman who has been sexually abused by a hacker uh, who threatened to compromise your devices, contact me and I will make sure that they're properly examined. Now the reason that I made this particular tweet was that I had just read an interview with uh, one of the uh, rapist's victims and the journalist asked her, uh, what took you so long to come forward? This was you know, many, many years later. Why did you wait so long? And she answered, I was scared. He was a hacker and I was some little punk kid and I had you know, 
I was really frightened that he was going to compromise my devices, that he would compromise my phone, that he would spy on my computer, that he would spy on my accounts, and he'd threaten to do so. And I thought that was so horrifying that she'd stayed silent for so long out of fear. And I didn't want anyone to ever feel that way again. So I tweeted this thing. And I thought, you know, you, you may notice that it is, uh, well, it says 3 p.m. here, but uh, in my local time, it was something like 11.30 at night. So this is like one of those sad late night tweets. Uh, so I sad late night tweet, and then I go to bed. And then I wake up the next morning, and it looks something like this. Uh, so 9,463 retweets later, uh, many people contacted me. Uh, I was hearing on average from anywhere up to like a dozen, sometimes 15 or 16 people a day. And I heard all kinds of different stories. I heard from uh, women who were concerned about you know, being spied on by their, by their former partners who were abusive. Um, but I also heard from uh, women who, were being, who felt that they were being spied on by women, from men who were being spied on by women, uh, their former partners, from men who were spied on by men. Um, but the vast majority of the abuse uh, that came to me, uh, again, I can't comment on the full scope of abuse because it doesn't show up in my inbox, uh, was uh, women who were being spied on by men who were often their former partners who had sexually uh, assaulted them. Mind you, that I'm, this may be a self-selecting sample because this is specifically the thing that I asked to see. So, uh, my inbox was full and uh, I was very busy and it was an extremely stressful time. Uh, I spent the next year and a half <laughs> working on this project that I had somehow non-consensually started uh, to do a full survey of the, the needs of women in this space who were being spied upon. Um, like many security researchers, I thought I understood what the problem was. I thought that the problem was that, they, you know, that women existed and they were being assaulted by hackers and they were scared and so they were staying silent. And so clearly what we needed to do was one at a time, we needed to talk to these women and help them out. Uh, and again, as a security researcher, I've discovered that when you do security research, um, you are almost never right about what the problem is until you have spent a lot of time on the ground talking to the actual victims. Because if the problem was easy to fix, it would have been fixed by now. Um, so the most common problem that I saw uh, was that victims often could not tell the difference between a device compromise and, a, and an account compromise. So it was really common for people to think that there was a rat on their phone or there was a rat on their computer when in fact uh, their abuser had just managed to guess the password to their Gmail account or their Facebook account or their Instagram account. In fact, generally, if it had a login, chances are it was compromised. This was incredibly common. Guessing passwords is easy. Uh, furthermore, sometimes it was not even necessary to, to guess passwords. It was extremely common for abusers to simply tell their victims uh, to hand over their passwords. If you loved me, you would tell me what your password is. You would allow me access to this account. If you had nothing to hide, you would let me use this account. Uh, sometimes they would simply uh, break into account the account because they could guess uh, their victims' uh, security questions. Because if you know someone well, uh, guessing the answers to their security questions is not terribly difficult. Um, there was a case, I think back in 2007, the dawn of time, uh, dinosaurs were, uh, were walking the earth and so was Sarah Palin. And uh, at the time, a young man man managed to break into her email account uh, by guessing her security questions, and the way in which she was able to guess her security, well, the answers to her security questions, was by reading her biography. So anybody who has, say, a Wikipedia page or a biography, lie on your security questions. Actually, anyone, just lie on your security questions. Lie. My mother's maiden name, Rumpelstiltskin. So, 
This was a really, really common problem. People thought that their devices had been compromised when their accounts had been compromised. And the good news is that we have advice for people with account compromise. Uh, as, as all of you are, are familiar with, if your account has been compromised, what you do is you change the password on your account. You make sure that your passwords are unique. You make sure that your passwords are strong. Uh, you use a password manager. Uh, and uh, you turn on the highest level of uh, two-factor authentication that you are comfortable using. So there are going to be people in this room who go, no, no, no. 2FA over SMS is, uh, is bullshit. This is, uh, this is simply not enough. It can be intercepted. There are all kinds of things that you can do, SIM hijacking, blah, 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 blah. And what I'm going to tell you is uh, when you are giving privacy and security advice uh, to victims of abuse or indeed uh, any non-technical person, uh, you have to give them advice they're actually going to follow. Because if you show up and you give them a bunch of advice and then uh, you say, uh, and then it's something very complicated that they don't feel comfortable doing and then they don't do it, then you haven't actually done any good. You've just patted yourself on the back, thrown a cape on and like flown away. And uh, this does not help people. It just leaves you feeling very smug. Um, so instead of smugness, let's try to actually help people and, and slowly work them through the, you know, all the different steps of, uh, of two-factor authentication. So the strongest version of SMS, or strongest version of, of uh, 2FA that you're comfortable with, ideally not SMS. Um, but I understand that not everybody is going to be going out and buying like YubiKeys because not everybody has a spare like 50 to 90 bucks. Um, so, the other good news is that if you have a compromised account, uh, there are frequently pages that you can go and take a look at. There will be like a tab on your, on your Facebook page that will tell you about all of the devices that have been logged in to your account. Uh, they may give you the IP address of those devices. They may tell you what kind of software those devices are running. And so, the first thing that we tell people is to go to these, uh, go to these tabs and see whether or not uh, they can find uh, devices that are unfamiliar. So we have advice, and that's good, good news. But sometimes it really is a rat. And while the instances of people uh, covertly installing rats on uh, victims' devices are how, were by far in the minority of the cases that I saw, they were the worst cases. They were the most frightening, they were the most persistent, they were the cases that were most likely to be associated with uh, really extreme harassment and often with violence and sometimes kidnapping of children and all kinds of other extremely unsavory things. And when it is a rat, uh, the big problem was that I didn't have a whole lot in the way of advice. If you have a rat on, on your device and that rat is uh, any of the you know, common uh, spouseware, there's, there's not a lot that you can do in order to see whether or not uh, that software is on your device. Uh, if you go to the you know, security tab on Facebook or uh, on your Google account, you're not going to see that there's some strange new device on there because that's not how rats work. Uh, so this was definitely a problem. And the way that I was solving it at first was it, the way in which I described it in that tweet, which was people would come to me individually, I would take a look at, uh, at their devices and I would arrange for them to get a uh, full forensic analysis. Now, this is not efficient. Uh, it takes a really long time, it takes a great deal of skill uh, you're usually looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, the person has to trust you enough to send you their device, which is incredibly sensitive. Um, they have to be able to go without their device for a certain amount of time. Uh, and uh, in other ways, this is uh, an extremely heavy lift. This is what we usually refer to in uh, sort of uh, nonprofit land as the hero model. And it's really satisfying. People come to you and you help them. Uh, and then they make grateful noises, and then Wired writes profiles of you in which you look off into the distance, uh, being very heroic. But the hero model is bullshit. It doesn't scale. 
It is a really good way to make sure that you burn out. It's a good way to make sure that there is a single point of failure with your project. Um, and it doesn't really punch above its own weight. Uh, you can only get as much done as one single human being. And the alternative is perhaps you can you know, do a little bit of parallel processing. You can get some other human beings on board. Uh, but that way lies starting your own NGO. And that way lies madness. So I spent some time thinking about what I could do that did not involve starting my own NGO. Because let me tell you, that did not sound like a good idea. If there is anything that I hate, it is the tedium of management and fundraising, which is what uh, running an NGO is essentially uh, consisting of, as opposed to the you know, nice warm feeling of doing forensic analysis. Uh, so I thought, what can I do? And I came up with some answers. I started by thinking about sort of the whole uh, panoply of, uh, of products that I was, uh, that I was looking at. Uh, how do we identify spouseware? How can you tell the difference between spouseware and something else? Spouseware and a yellow butterfly uh, off in the distance in that meme. Um, so uh, the good news is that spouseware will often tell you it is spouseware. Uh, all you have to do is a Google search for uh, how do I spy on my girlfriend's phone, or how do I spy on my boyfriend's phone, or how do I catch my cheating spouse, uh, and you will get a bunch of search results. This is so much easier than tracking APTs. If you want to track state actors, you have to go find the people who are being, you know, who are being targeted. You have to win their trust. You have to have them looking out for like, you know, signs of compromise. But if I want a sample of, a, uh, of spouseware, all I have to do is Google it and buy it. So I did. Uh, the other uh, extremely convenient thing about, uh, the, about spouseware is they advertise. Uh, so this here is an ad that uh, the Spouseware company uh, MSpy recently had up on Twitter. So MSpy uh, has its own Twitter account. They bought a bunch of Twitter ads. Uh, they insist that they are a tool for, uh, for parents to track their children. But if you take a close look at this ad, it says, MSpy light phone tracker app. What is she hiding from you? Find our, our, well, okay, there's no accounting for typos, uh, with MSpy. Now, does this man look like he is tracking his children to see whether they're getting to school on time? No, this is clearly an ad about you know, spying on your spouse, spying on your significant other, spying on your girlfriend or boyfriend, and doing so without their consent. <coughs> this is abuse. Uh, so uh, some of us reported uh, this to Twitter. We said, you know, hey, this is some abusive bullshit. And uh, Twitter took the ads down. Um, but we should not have to live in a world in which uh, journalists and activists police M spies, you know, ad practices or police Twitter's ad practices. Twitter ha already has, a, uh, has an abuse team, and this is abuse. And this is the sort of thing that they should be doing. Uh, they should be reviewing ads. And in fact, they have a terms of service. This is a violation of their terms of service. And they should have caught it earlier. I should not be doing Twitter's job for them in the same way that I shouldn't be doing Facebook's job for them. I shouldn't be doing Google's job for them. If I did, I'd be paid better. So how else do you know it's spouseware? Again, you take a look at the ad copy. Uh, Access to CocoSpy gives you the lead on how to spy on your wife with ease. <laughs> you do not have to worry about where she goes, who she talks to, or the websites that she visits. I mean, or you could just like have a chat with her or something. But um, this is about enabling abuse. There's absolutely no question that this is, uh, is not a consensual relationship that you are entering into. Uh, this, this is absolutely about covert spying. Um, this is my personal favorite, and as much as I have any personal favorite in spouseware advertising, uh, this is a page put up by a, uh, 
by a, a spouseware company called HelloSpy. It has since been taken down. Uh, and as you can see uh, up across, the, uh, across the top, the title is Mobile Spy App for Personal Catch Cheating Spouses. I don't know why the people who, uh, who make these apps are so bad at grammar. Um, it, is, it is an eternal mystery. But this entire paragraph right here is a, it is a set of paragraphs about the prevalence of cheating about how bad cheating spouses are, about how likely you are to be cheated upon. And then what we have here, just in case you were unclear, uh, is a picture of a man uh, grabbing a woman with a bruised and bloody face. And let there be no question, Hello Spy is on the side of the guy beating the woman. It is on the side of the abuser. That is the, the product that they're trying to sell to you is catch her cheating so you can give her a black eye. This is not subtle stuff. Now, why do we think this sort of thing is okay? Uh, this all comes back to my, my very early work in 2011. Again, dinosaurs roaming the earth, also Sarah Palin. Um, and while I was doing all of this work on Syria, I was largely tracking the use of a free remote access tool called Dark Comet. So this is the guy who wrote Dark Comet. Uh, his name is Jean-Pierre Lesseur. Uh, he is not very popular. And in 2012, after I had spent the better part of a year writing um, a bunch of reports about how Dark Comet was being used to spy on uh, Syrian activists, and potentially getting them killed, uh, Jean-Pierre Lesseur announced that he was shutting down uh, the Dark Comet Rat project. And what he said was, when I first built this free to everybody, publicly available remote access tool, I never thought that it was going to be used to spy on activists. That's bad. I never thought that it was going to be used by authoritarian governments. That's bad. And what did he think it was going to be used for? By guys to spy on their girlfriends. And that's fine. So the biggest problem that we really have among, uh, among coders, among the people in the information security industry, is that we have this notion that somehow this kind of spying is okay that spying by governments is wrong, but that spying on your spouse is fine, because clearly that spouse is probably cheating. You have a right to know what the hell is going on. You should be able to covertly install software in order to figure out what's going on. That is harmless. It's totally fine. And I'm here to tell you, no, it's not fine. That's abuse. It's shitty. Um, so again, how do we know the difference between spouseware and some sort of regular parental tracking app, something you know, relatively benign? Uh, deception. The thing that, that I am particularly appalled by and uh, that I really would like to see you know, eliminated is software that allows a user to covertly track uh, someone else's device. And I had a very hard time getting companies to start seeing this kind of behavior as malicious. And frequently what they would tell me is, but in order to install this software, you need to have the device's username and password. And a, a username and a password is uh, essentially the same as having uh, legitimate access to a device, right? And I had to tell them, I have news for you about how abuse works. It is extremely common for abusers to have the username and password of their victim in order to covertly install this kind of software. And so we need to be fighting uh, this software uh, in and of itself. Um, at the time when I started my project, well, not the time I started my project, about a year into my project, this is uh, uh, some like uh, VT uh, scans from, I think, April of this year. Uh, the detection rates for spouseware and stalkerware were extremely low. So I believe this is uh, the detection rate for, uh, I think, Hello Spy. And you can see that the detection rate is 7 out of 60. 
that's kind of crap. Uh, and then just in case that was some sort of mistake, uh, here are the detection rates for the truth spy. As you can see, 10 out of 61. And this was actually one of the higher detection rates that I came across uh, at the time when I started my project. And what this means is that if you have Spouseware installed on your phone or on your computer, and you also have antivirus protection and you run your antivirus to see whether or not there's something malicious on your device, there is a very good chance that you will not get a message telling you that there's something wrong. Uh, and this is really where I chose to plant my flag uh, this spring. So I went to, I went to Singapore uh, to a conference that had been put on by Kaspersky and uh, sort of addressed the entire antivirus industry. And what I achieved, I like winning, uh, was that I managed to convince Kaspersky to uh, not only have uh, add detection for spouseware and stalkerware uh, on their antivirus offerings, uh, but also to market specifically as malicious with its own uh, privacy alert. So you know when there is spouseware on your phone or you know when there is spouseware on your computer. And that's a really big change. Uh, and the good news is that once you get one company on board, other companies follow because nobody wants a single AV company to have a competitive advantage. So uh, next, we, uh, we saw this post from Lookout. Lookout uh, mostly does uh, mobile malware detection. And their blog post was essentially, oh yes, we have always detected spouseware and stalkerware. It's always been extremely important to us. Uh, and really, their detection rates are pretty good. So I was very pleased about that. Uh, and uh, next, uh, Malwarebytes just, uh, I think last week, uh, put out a post saying that not only are they uh, ramping up their detection for spouseware and stalkerware, but also they, uh, they published a guide to you know, what to do if you think you have spouseware or stalkerware uh, on your computer or on your phone and the ways in which you might want to uh, sort of tell the difference between uh, account compromise and device compromise, because that's really one of the biggest problems that we saw. So uh, this leads us in the sort of where do we go from here theme to uh, what can people do? Uh, there are lots of different kinds of actors in this space. And uh, the first is definitely the antivirus industry. So I have gone to the antivirus industry and I've told them, here's what you need to do. You need to detect spyware and stalkerware. It's not hard. You don't need me to tell you how to do it. You run searches, you download APKs, you, you know, mark the stuff as malicious, done. Um, the next thing you need to do is you need to label it as malicious so that people know, you know this stuff is bad. Uh, and finally, you need to stay on top of it because just like all other uh, APTs, uh, they change, they rebrand themselves, they uh, will almost certainly start playing a cat and mouse game with the antivirus companies. Uh, and so it's not enough to just um, make a list of spouseware and stalkerware once, uh, pat yourself on the back, throw on a cape, and fly away. Uh, this does not actually help anyone. So you need to stay on top of it. You need to assign a person whose job it is to care about spouseware and constantly be uh, downloading new samples and keeping track of the new techniques being used by the companies. What can Google do? So uh, you may have noticed that most of the problems that, uh, that we're looking at uh, are, affect uh, Android phones and, uh, and not iOS devices. And one of the reasons for this is because iOS is very heavily locked down. Uh, most of the products that, uh, that I was looking at um, will only work on iOS in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first is, uh, first you have to jailbreak the phone. And uh, the latest untethered jailbreak for, uh, for iOS is like years old, like many, many versions back. So you need to have physical access to the device and you need to jailbreak it and then you can, down you can install the thing. Um, iOS devices can also be compromised by scraping uh, iCloud backups. That is uh, the most common way that these things work. Um, but the Android ecosystem is a wonder and uh, it has 
many, many potential flaws that are exploited by these, uh, by these companies. And so you see a lot of stalkerware and spouseware uh, which works on Android devices. Uh, the older, the better. And this is particularly concerning um, not in populations of, you know, sort of upper middle class white people living in Manhattan, uh, but in, uh, in populations of, of people of limited means, uh, people outside of the United States, uh, people who, you know, don't necessarily have access to like a, a pixel phone or, uh, you know, uh, uh, iPhone X. Uh, most of the world runs on old Android devices, and those devices are extremely vulnerable. So one of the things that Google really needs to do is they need to do a better job of policing the Google Play Store. Uh, these devices are already in violation of Google Play's terms of service, and Google does occasionally take them down, uh, but they don't stay on top of it quite as rigorously as I would like. Um, obviously, it's still possible to sideload uh, these, these things uh, onto uh, Android devices, but that is the nature of Android. You have more than one store, uh, unlike, uh, unlike Apple. And those are the trade-offs that you make. You get, uh, you get privacy or security. Um, so uh, what can the platforms do? Well. Uh, they can stop advertising stalkerware and spyware to, to their users. Basically, don't be Twitter. Don't be that guy. Uh, when spyware and stalkerware companies show up and offer you money and say, I'm going to buy some ads, when you review those ads, say, hey, that's really creepy. We're not going to advertise that. We're not going to enable domestic abuse. This is gross. Let's pass. You don't have to take everybody's money. What can developers do? So uh, a lot of you here are, are people who are developing products, who are working on projects. Uh, and there are a couple of suggestions I have for sort of best practices for security and privacy for uh, people who want to think about domestic abuse uh, as a potential threat model, just like one of those things that you build for. Uh, so have one page or one tab where the user can see all of the accounts that have access to their data and what data they have access to. You should just have one place where you can find all of this. Um, you should have one page or tab that allows users to see what devices and IP addresses have recently logged into their account. Again, you know, fairly, fairly basic, one place. Uh, and uh, last of all, uh, support 2FA for logins. And again, uh, if you could do better than SMS, I would be very happy if all you can manage is, is SMS. Fine, fine, but uh, it's certainly better than nothing. And finally, what can governments do? So frequently, I am brought in to, uh, to give this talk outside of the United States. And I don't really have an analysis for the laws that these, uh, uh, that these companies are breaking outside of the US because uh, when all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like, the, like a nail. And what I have is a hammer in the form of a uh, floor full of uh, angry, uh, U.S. lawyers. So I have a uh, U.S. legal analysis. Uh, fortunately, that's where I am right now. So <laughs> that makes my life a little bit easier. Uh, so frequently when people see a problem like this, their response is there ought to be a law. And I'm skeptical when I hear this sort of thing. Uh, I, I don't always think that the answer is to pass new laws. And so the first thing that I did was I uh, I called upon my floor of angry American attack lawyers, and I said, what laws already exist? Uh, let's talk about the laws that are already on the books uh, that could possibly be enforced in order to uh, protect victims of uh, spouseware and stalkerware. And what did we discover? Uh, there are some federal laws that cover this, uh, including the Federal Wiretap Act. Uh, if you are... Uh, Recording somebody's phone conversations, that is a violation of the Federal Wiretap Act. Um, the Stored Communications Act, which is also a federal law. And finally, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. I am very familiar with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act because it is very broadly written. And so frequently, EFF uh, brings cases to court uh, in which someone has been charged with a violation of the CFAA for doing something that we think is not illegal. 
Uh, that doesn't mean that we think all uses of the CFAA are bad. And there are definitely cases uh, with the use of stalkerware and, uh, and spouseware where we think that uh, bringing a CFAA case is not out of the question. Um, as you can see here, uh, occasionally the Department of Justice does actually go after a, uh, a stalkerware or spouseware company. Uh, this is a page by uh, the page of a, a software company called Stealth Genie, and uh, I believe their product was uh, was taken off of the market in 2012, and they had to enter into a uh, an agreement to uh, stop. Uh, advertising their product and also to you know, stop installing it covertly on, on devices because it turns out that's very creepy and bad and illegal. Um, the FTC has also gotten involved in, uh, on occasion in uh, cases where, um, such as in 2012, the FTC charged uh, Designerware LLC, a company that uh, provided spyware to rent to own computer providers and they entered into a consent decree with the company agreeing not to collect data from computers without giving clear and prominent notice and obtaining affirmative consent. Um, also in uh, 2008, the FTC sued uh, CyberSpy Software, which sold a keylogger program. Uh, the company entered into a consent decree with the FTC in 2010, in which it agreed not to promote, sell, or distribute software to be installed on computers without the knowledge and consent of the computer's owner. So let's uh, talk a little bit about state laws, uh, including the parental right to spy on their children. So a lot of the time when we start talking about uh, spouseware and stalkerware, somebody will raise a hand and they will say, but what about my right to, to track my kids? Uh, I want to make sure that my kids are getting to school. I don't want them to be you know, talking to pedophiles online. I want to make sure that you know, no one is is stealing their photos, they're not doing anything sketchy, and I have a right to do this because these are my children, they are, uh, uh, they are minors, and I am their guardian. So, uh, most courts have found that parents may vicariously consent on behalf of their minor children to record the child's oral, wire, or electronic communications, uh, which does make those interceptions legal under the Federal Wiretapping Act. Uh, for example, the courts found that a parent in a custody battle could surreptitiously record their child's phone conversations with the other parent, or where the parent was concerned about the abuse of the child. Um, but that power is not unlimited. This is not phenomenal cosmic power. Um, it is generally permitted to the extent that the parent can demonstrate a good faith, objectionably reasonable basis for believing uh, that, uh, this, that this is necessary for the welfare of the child. So again, not phenomenal cosmic power, not unlimited. And even then, um, what I would really like to see with the child tracking apps is uh, some version of consent. If you are a parent who needs to track their child, uh, what harm is there in your child knowing that they're being tracked? That there is a, uh, you know, there is an icon on their screen that informs them this particular program is running and these are the things that it does. Uh, you should never have to track your child surreptitiously. Uh, I, I think that that still constitutes abuse even if it is legal. Um, so in uh, US states, we have state wiretapping statutes. Uh, we have two-party consent laws. Uh, California, for example, is a two-party consent state. It is uh, not legal for me to record somebody else's uh, phone conversations uh, without their explicit consent. Uh, I experience this all the time when I'm talking to journalists on the phone because frequently what they want to do is they want to record a conversation so that they will get your quotes right. Uh, and the first thing that they will say is, is it okay for me to record our conversation for me to use later? And I give my explicit consent and then they start recording the conversation. Um, and uh, in California, the great state of California, we also have the Consumer Protection Against Consumer Spyware Act, uh, which makes uh, key loggers illegal. So we have, uh, we have a lot of tools with which to go after this problem. Uh, we just mostly haven't. So the last thing that I wanted to say about uh, spouseware and stalkerware 
is that I did not invent these terms. Every once in a while, I'll, I'll read an article and they'll be like, ah, Eva Galperin, synonymous with stalkerware and spouseware, leading the fight in blah, 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 blah. Uh, no, I, I am not the first person to do this. Uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And in, uh, in my case, the first use of the terms uh, spouseware and stalkerware that I was able to find online uh, go back as far as 2007. So this is extremely not new. Um, work on uh, the uh, sort of culprits behind this and the various companies and their capabilities and data leaks uh, has been done by journalists for years, including uh, journalists at uh, Vice's Motherboard blog, which has an entire series called uh, When Spies Come Home, which I strongly recommend to all of you. Uh, so Lorenzo and Joseph Cox have been doing this work for years. Uh, Thomas Brewster at Forbes has been doing this work for years. There are people who have been on the ground working with individuals doing the, doing the hero thing uh, for many years before me, including uh, Harlow Holmes, who works at the uh, Freedom of Press Foundation. Uh, Chris Cox has been doing this work with uh, women's uh, shelters for many years. I did not invent this stuff. Uh, and we all have to work together if we're going to make any kind of progress because the decisions that we make when we are writing software make a difference. Uh, the decisions that we make when we are creating platforms and their policies make a difference. The decisions that we make uh, when we vote for our representatives make a difference. And if we don't get up and do this and think of the domestic abuse uh, sort of scenario as a, uh, as a possible threat to our users, uh, then we continue to enable this sort of abuse uh, by turning a blind eye to it. Thank you very much. And now I answer all your questions. Hey, I'm going to ask a question. I'm over here to your left. Hey there. Uh, uh, if I'm given a binary, uh, how, what operations will it perform that would indicate it's uh, the sort of software we should eliminate? It depends. So, but, but you have an audience <laughs> full of people who do that kind of work, so you could actually have a lot of leverage if you could try and answer that question. This is true, but again, it depends. Uh, really, the kind of behavior that you're looking for is, uh, is specifically uh, covert spying. So you want to, to look for uh, the ability to turn on the microphone uh, without uh, setting off any notifications. You want to look for the ability to turn on a camera without, uh, without setting off the light. That is a, a really, really common indicator uh, for the ability to log keystrokes uh, and send those off. Uh, so that's the kind of behavior that, uh, that is particularly suspicious. I can't think of a lot of reasons to turn on somebody's camera on, say, their laptop without alerting them uh, that are benign. Yes? Uh, so you mentioned that, for instance, Google or Twitter, these big companies can help promote these, these kinds of products. So are they ever, have there been lawsuits or any kind of action that's named them as part of the problem or, or push them to, to explicitly change their policies to try to combat this? Uh, their policies usually are already explicitly banning this kind of, uh, this kind of advertising or this kind of content. Uh, the problem is that it gets through anyway. So it's just insufficient enforcement, not a problem with the policies themselves. But are there ways to encourage them to enforce better, like, uh, you know, punishment through lawsuits or something like that? Um, I am not a lawyer and I cannot answer this complicated legal question, uh, but I can tell you that one thing that works is shame. <laughs> I believe strongly in the power of shame. Uh, and so when I see this sort of behavior, I, uh, I tend to make it public uh, or report it to their, uh, to their abuse department. And, uh, they will often bow to this kind of pressure very quickly. 
Um, I would just rather that they did the enforcement themselves without me having to do it for them, because honestly, I've got other things to do with my time. Yes. Thanks. So what, can, uh, what can people in this room do uh, to help? Well, uh, there are a bunch of things that you can do. The first is uh, become a member of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I mean, I understand that's, that's kind of a, like, it's a bit pat, but uh, EFF has 40,000 members all over the world. Uh, we are a membership-driven organization. Uh, without membership dues, the, the, the pact that we make with our members, which is that uh, you send us money and then we send you uh, t-shirts and stickers, um, I do not get paid. I can't do my job. Uh, EFF does not have an office. We cannot fly people all over the world. We definitely can't continue to build the tools that we, that we build or file any of the lawsuits that we do. So we depend on people like you. Uh, and without you, we are nothing. It is really common for organizations in my space to be uh, funded by states or funded by governments funded by, uh, by corporations, by Google, by Facebook. And when you're funded by, uh, by these kinds of sources, you are, um, you're subject to capture. You, if, if all of your money comes from Google, it's really tempting to decide that your vision of the internet is, uh, as a free place is the same as Google's uh, vision of the internet as a free place, and you'll never oppose Google or Facebook, or the US government, or the Russian government, or the Dutch government, or whoever it is that's giving you money. Uh, EFF uh, fights for the users. We, we are the Tron of the internet. And uh, the reason for that is because we can tell any of those other sources of, uh, of funding to bugger off. Uh, we don't need them. Our primary source of funding is uh, all of these tiny little donations from people all over the world, and that is why we work so hard to represent them instead of uh, corporate and state interests. To build on that same question, uh, yes. many of us in this room work on building software that checks other software to verify that it does what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Can this sort of thing be helpful in your efforts? It depends. Um, frequently, um, the software that I'm talking about is pretty clear about what it does. It's not trying to fool the, uh, the person who is purchasing the software into thinking that it's, it's some sort of benign tool. It's advertised as this you know, malicious covert spying. Uh, what I would recommend doing is when you're asked to check this sort of uh, uh, software, understand that every choice you make is political. The, Choosing to support this kind of spying is, uh, is an abusive act and that you are contributing to abuse. Um, and it really makes a difference to, to stand up and say that this kind of software is not okay. And it makes a difference in the sort of domestic abuse cases, but it also makes a difference when you're working for a state. Uh, it is really common for uh, governments to hire people to do uh, all kinds of very interesting investigative security work, which includes writing uh, you know, invasive rats and implants. And I would ask that the people in this room, when they are asked to do this sort of work, uh, when they are told, but we will only catch bad guys, uh, to view these claims with skepticism and to think about the civil liberties of the people who are being spied upon uh, and to choose privacy and to choose civil liberties over uh, the need to spy on everybody all the time and turning our world into a panopticon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bad software. I'd like to uh, know what you think about uh, such software like uh, deep fakes uh, and uh, deep nudes, uh, if you're familiar with that. Uh, it's the software that uh, generates uh, uh, artificial uh, pornography. Well, uh, in some ways this is very different from the kind of software that I fight uh, because it's not about being covert. And the power of this kind of software uh, lies 
not in how convincing it is. Um, the power of the software lies in misogyny. Uh, there would never be a need for like a for deep fakes of you know women cut and pasted into pornography if that wasn't considered humiliating to the women. Uh, one of the most common situations that, uh, that I've been sort of called into uh, in doing this work uh, is uh, people contact me, uh, young women contact me, when they've had their accounts uh, compromised by an attacker who stole their nudes and is threatening to send their, their nude photos to everybody in their contact list, to their parents, to their church, to their school. And uh, often, this attacker is someone that they know, uh, sometimes an ex-boyfriend, sometimes uh, you know, uh, somebody who really wanted to be their boyfriend, but is clearly not going to win it this way. Like, what kind of charm offensive is this? Um, so I see this all the time. And I think that this is not a fight that we can win with a technical solution. This is a social problem. And the social problem is that when, uh, when someone posts a naked picture of a woman, that the woman is humiliated and not the person who stole the picture and posted it. And I think that really only when we address the root of the problem, uh, the, the shame that is associated with, with sexting or selfies or like the nude female body, um, can we really address the problem of deep fake porn? Because it's rooted so deeply in, uh, in misogyny. Thank you. Yes. So um, uh, certainly my consciousness was raised by uh, your talk, for which I'm very grateful. Um, but then it occurred to me that actually raising consciousness can be sort of a double-edged sword sometimes, in that especially the tech-savvy, malignant people who will, are more likely to hear this might say, oh, that's a great idea. I'm going to go get Co Coco's buy right now. So I'm, I'm curious on your perspective about that, uh, about that aspect of uh, the talks like these that you're giving. Well, I hear exactly the same thing about, uh, about work on APT research. Uh, if you report on state actors doing certain things, that other states will get those ideas, that individuals will get those ideas, that they will, you know, uh, if you do any kind of security research that people will take advantage of the vulnerabilities that you report on that haven't been patched yet. Um, this, is, this is the nature of security research. Um, but I think it does more good than it does harm, uh, especially if I can change the norm within the industry in terms of uh, how antivirus sees uh, spouseware and stalkerware, and I can change the norm within the industry about how people who write software view spouseware and stalkerware as, uh, as somehow okay to write or okay to sell or okay to advertise. So <clears throat> two questions, I guess. Uh, first, now that, now that we have some awareness mm -hmm. of the, the stalkerware, uh, do you think that the problem is, is getting better? And, and the second thing is, you know, with ubiquitous computing and new, new kinds of devices and other things, is there any way that we can uh, improve the situation for wearables and for medical and other things as, as they come down the line? All right, so uh, first question, uh, are things getting better? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I am a scientist, I am a researcher, and so I think that in order to find out whether or not things are getting, getting better, more research is needed. Uh, this is actually a project that I'm in the middle of doing right now, uh, tracking the uptake of, uh, by the antivirus industry uh, of the sort of new awareness of spouseware and stalkerware, um, because before I claim victory and leave, I would like some actual evidence that things are working, and if things are not working, then I can try other methods. Um, I think one of the biggest problems with security research, especially security research in the sort of nonprofit and NGO world, is we're afraid to see whether or not our methods are working because we're afraid that the answer is that they're not. Uh, and I am not afraid of seeing that I have failed because I'd like to know if I have failed so I can go do something else. 
uh, I am very interested in knowing whether or not my methods are effective. And so I'm going to like, get up here in front of all of you and tell you, right now, I don't know. But I'm trying to find out. Uh, the other question was about uh, Internet of Things things, uh, IoT devices. So I get, uh, I get people coming to me probably uh, less than the number of people who are coming to me with their nudes being, you know, uh, with people threatening to, to leak their nudes. Uh, but probably like the next biggest concern is, uh, how, is the compromise of someone's IoT devices. And I've actually seen the compromise of some devices, including nests, uh, sometimes the fitness trackers, uh, lights in people's homes, flashing on and off, all kinds of craziness. Uh, and the biggest problem is that uh, I think this is going to get worse before it gets better because we have really seen the proliferation of wearables and, uh, and Internet of Things devices throughout our lives uh, increase over the last several years. Uh, you can now walk into a Best Buy and buy an Alexa. You can set up Google Home. Uh, our houses are now full of cameras and microphones that are always listening, and that creates a really tempting target. For, uh, for hackers, and especially in cases of domestic abuse. One of the most common setups that I have seen in, a best, in domestic abuse cases is a setup in which the abuser was living with the person that they were abusing, brought the uh, invasive devices into the home, set up the, the invasive devices, and they're the only person who knows how they work properly. So they leave and they still have access because um, the... Uh, the victim doesn't know how to lock them out. So that is a really common situation, and I would like to urge people who are working on wearables and people who are working on uh, home devices to think about the abuse context and to make it easy to lock somebody out of your home. Uh, what the, the idea that somebody who was once welcome is no longer welcome should uh, be in the threat model that you build for when you are building uh, devices for the home. Next question. Yes. Um, I guess this kind of follows off your answer you just made now, but um, it was an interesting point about how this kind of software is much more um, common on Android devices versus iPhones, for instance. Um, it seems like it would be great to have some kind of um, operating system that you know respects user freedom but also blocks out uh, this kind of stuff. Do you have any ideas about like designs for that, or are there other people like working on that kind of thing? Um, Many people have been working on this project to, with limited success. Uh, part of it is because uh, security for phones is often a trade-off with uh, with privacy issues, and that is one of the biggest problems that we've seen. And I work for an organization that values free and open source software, that values your ability to tinker with the things that you buy. We believe very strongly that you bought it, you own it, you can do whatever you want with it. You should be able to download whatever software you want onto it. Uh, you should be able to do security research on it. Uh, I don't like this crystal prison that we live in now of, uh, of devices that we can't tinker with. But in the case of Apple, uh, the primary benefit of the crystal prison has been greater security. It is much harder, and this is an objective fact that I cannot argue with, uh, for people to break into their devices, and I see a lot less abuse on these sorts of devices for those reasons. I think that as a person who values both security and the freedom to tinker, that we should have uh, sort of the, the full scope of you know, different kinds of devices to choose from. Um, but we also need to be honest with users about what the trade-offs are so that people know what they're buying and know what they're sacrificing when they decide to buy one kind of device or another. So I have a question. Yeah. We normally think sort of when we're thinking about authorization to a device, we think you know the password, you have the device, that means you have the right to control it. Mm -hmm. But clearly there are situations in which that's not true. What are sort of signals that could be used in order to, in order to sort of capture 
that model? Two or are there FA, any? two FA, two FA, two FA. Uh, uh, uh. I, I get her SMSs as well, right? So yes. I have her device in my hand. I get her SMSs. Right, so, yeah, so a partner, for example, who has access to their partner's device, mm -hmm. like they turn on SMS, the partner still gets the SMS. Yes. Like, what, is there any sort of a Yeah, well, that's, way that's of where, where you start using YubiKeys. You know, you're, you're, hopefully your partner does not, have, even if they have access to your device, they don't have access to your, uh, to your key. Um, so you just sort of keep the, you know, kind of heaping difficulties upon them. Uh, and the most common situation that I have seen uh, for abuse is abuse by a partner who used to have physical access to the device who no longer has physical access to the device. Um, and so that is something that 2FA is extremely effective against. Um, there are situations, as you have pointed out, uh, where 2FA does no good because you have the device, because you have access to the device, because you're inside, because you have notifications turned on. So even if somebody doesn't ha can't unlock the device, they can still see uh, that you have been sent an SMS with this code. Uh, and that's really a matter of education. I, I would really like to see um, two-factor SMSs sent uh, without giving a notification directly to the screen by default. Uh, I think that that is a very serious problem that I have encountered again and again. Anybody else? We have answered all the questions. No? Hi, I have a question more from the policy advocacy point of view. That's the area I work on. So I noticed that the consent degree, and I think the legal challenge you mentioned in your presentation were from around 2012, 2011. Mm -hmm. And since it sounds like you've done so much work on this and have much more evidence now, I'm wondering if EFF has any cases, planned legal challenges in the near future, or if there are any other organizations or, or lawyers you're aware of who are working on this. I also, picking up on your point about shaming working, I'm wondering if there's any efforts towards investor advocacy to the investors behind these companies. And finally, I work for an organization that's been working on gender-based violence uh, through technology for 10, 15 years now, the Association for Progressive Communications, working mostly at the global level in, in countries outside of the US. And we've been actually seeing some normative uh, progress at the UN level, um, recognizing technology-facilitated gender-based violence as a violation of human rights. A number of UN special rapporteurs and treaty bodies are working on these issues. So I'm wondering if there are any efforts through AFF to bring the cases you're seeing or the trends and, and violations to these mechanisms, or if there's any efforts to partner around those. Thanks. I've been approached by a number of lawmakers uh, asking sort of what they can do and who they can pressure. And so one of the things that I'm, uh, I'm really eager to work on is uh, working with the Department of Justice and with state's attorneys general uh, on bringing cases against uh, individual software companies. And this is not a thing that, uh, that EFF even necessarily needs to do because this is a thing which uh, you know, we, we have a state for. Um, I have also on my long list of things to do is uh, more education for, uh, for police departments. Uh, it turns out that one of the biggest problems that we see again and again is that uh, victims who have spouseware and stalkerware installed on their devices come to their local police departments, show them the evidence, and police departments don't know what to do. Uh, and so they're not interested in prosecuting because they don't even understand the evidence that has been brought to them. Uh, and they don't necessarily think that this is a, a good use of their limited resources. Anytime that I go to police departments or state's attorneys general or uh, the DOJ and I tell them, you should prosecute this thing, their reply is, okay, tell me what I shouldn't be prosecuting. What do I need to drop? In order, to, uh, in order to go work on this. Now, I have some suggestions for some things they could be dropping. <laughs> um, but before I do that, uh, I think the, the most important thing that we need to do right now is uh, to educate uh, police departments. Before I start educating police departments, I'm approaching it in sort of the same way that I approached um, addressing the, the entire spectrum of uh, spouse wear and stalker wear abuse which was, I go in and I think I know what the problem is, and I'm probably wrong. So the next thing that I need to do is I need to go and talk to people who have uh, experience educating uh, 
the you know educating the police and educating police departments about these issues, and uh, talk to them about how do you approach them, what do you teach them, what kind of uh, sort of trade-offs are they making, uh, what kind of assumptions am I making that are wrong? So this is a it's a very long process, <laughs> and uh, I really haven't gotten there yet. Uh, but I try to approach it from a very kind of uh, humble place of knowing nothing uh, before, I, before I show up and go like, ha-ha, I know what your problem is. I'm here to solve it for you, and we're going to save all the abused women. Because honestly, like, that doesn't work. I just end up looking foolish. Um, so you had a couple of other questions. You had a question about, about investor advocacy? Um, well, I actually haven't seen strong investor advocacy from the makers, uh, you know, makers of spouseware, because makers of spouseware usually don't have a whole lot in the way of investors. It's usually fairly small companies doing shady stuff. Um, but I would really like to see investor advocacy uh, pushing the platforms to, to be better about enforcing the policies that they already have. Um, I think that that is potentially very effective because, as I said, uh, companies respond to shame. Uh, I didn't think they did, but it turns out that shame is, in fact, very effective if you have like a large enough platform. And uh, EFF is a reasonable size platform, uh, and we like partnering with other organizations, uh, fellow travelers in our field, uh, so that we can all sort of raise up a voice and say, you know, the people of the internet think that uh, this advertising is wrong or that having these, um, these programs uh, available in the Google Play Store is wrong, uh, or you know, uh, taking, uh, processing payments for, uh, for this you know, sort of abusive software is wrong. Uh, so there are a lot of arguments that we can make. There's, there's still a lot to do. Anybody else? All right. Well, we'd like to thank you so much. For thank you. Now I fly away.